what I'd like to do is welcome you to the book launch this evening. Uh, I feel it's, mo it's most fitting that we're marking our 125th anniversary with the pu publication of two major contributions to the history of the higher education of women. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Anne Souter, the compiler of St. Hugh's College Register, 1886 to 1959. Although to many of you, she needs no introduction. When you get a chance to look at the register, which if you follow the principal's advice, as we of course always do, um, it will be sooner rather than later. And you will see that Anne read modern languages here as the 2,261st student at St. Hugh's. She's had a wonderfully varied and distinguished career since then, which you can read all about in the register. It was Anne who first suggested that the Association of Senior Members compile a register of past students, and it was she who, at first single-handedly, set about the enormous task. In her introduction to the register, she gives generous thanks um, to others, and before inviting her to tell us something about the work, I want to take this opportunity of thanking her on behalf of both the ASM and college. Only those of you, and I suspect there aren't very many of you, who've been involved in anything like this combination of a who was who and a who's who of 2,463 lives, got it wrong, <laughs> um, can have any, have any idea of the amount of work and the variety of qualities required. Perseverance, enthusiasm, attention to detail, accuracy, endless patience, all of which Anne has in spades, topped with the skills to typeset the 413 pages herself and to compile the index. It's been a Herculean task, and we're all delighted that Anne has brought it to such a fascinating and successful conclusion. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. right. Um, this is quite a moment for me, because as uh, you will have gathered, the register has taken 20 years to produce. I started work on it in 1991, not 1981, as Andrew said earlier. And I learned perhaps too late that the work could not be done without a supporting team. Over the last three or four years, I've had tremendous backup from Mary Clappinson as co-editor and from Janetta Corley, who, with characteristic modesty, didn't want her name on the title page, but thoroughly deserves to be there. Joan Swindles also made a significant contribution, and special thanks are also due to the staff in the College Office and Development Office, who processed letters and emails to some 900 living members out of the total of 2,643 entries. A huge amount of research went into clearing up hundreds of queries, resolving inconsistencies in the college record, correcting errors, and filling in gaps. No work of this kind could be completely free of errors, and we are especially indebted to the large number of senior members who were able to return corrected entries to us. No doubt we shall be receiving further corrections, which will be recorded in due course as the register is updated. If you've already looked at the front and rear covers of the register, you will at once have appreciated the gulf of time that separates those earnest, narrow-waisted young ladies swathed in yards and yards of dark fabric from the rather jolly 1959 intake photographed at their jubilee in their bright colours and short skirts. In compiling the register, I became very conscious in, sorry, in compiling the register, I became very conscious of the huge changes that had occurred in between. And what I would like to do now is to comment on aspects of the register which I found particularly interesting and sometimes very moving. Some of these are, I am sure, worthy of further research. First, there's the great procession of high schools and grammar schools in addition to the girls' public schools, which sent so many of their best students to St. Hugh's long before degrees were open to women. 
it would be good to have a statistical summary. In so many cases, one has to ask, where are they now? Some survive in their original form, but others have closed or changed beyond recognition. The same schools took our senior members back as teachers in very many cases, and at least until after the Second World War, there was a great sense of stability and solid achievement. Secondly, there was the impact of war on so many lives, and I don't mean just the two world wars, but the Boer War as well. Young graduates were going out to South Africa at the turn of the last century, initially as teachers, but then as nurses. And it doesn't just affect those who matriculated during war years. One thinks of Doreen Warriner, for instance, who matriculated in 1922 and played a major role in refugee relief work in Prague in the late 30s and 40s. Some lost their lives. Chronicle 19 lists eight senior members killed by enemy action in World War II. There may well have been several more. The oldest matriculated in 1891 and the youngest in 1940. The oldest, in fact, escaped the bombardment of Scarborough in 1914. Who knew about that? Only to be killed by a direct hit on her house in 1940. Another, who was herself disabled, crippled by polio, was killed by a bomb on a Sussex beach while caring for disabled children. For those who survived, very many senior members who matriculated in the war years had their lives totally disrupted by compulsory conscription in the armed forces, and many of them were sent to work at Bletchley Park. But there were many others working with evacuees, for instance, or nursing at home and abroad, ambulance driving, involved in rehabilitation work, and so on, and then having to come back to Oxford to pick up the pieces of their fragmented lives. And again, there were refugees from Europe who found safety in Oxford. And I can think also of at least two senior members who were imprisoned, one by the Gestapo and one for anti-communist activities in Hungary in the 1950s. Before reaching Oxford, she had served four years of a 10-year sentence in jail. There were good effects. For instance, these wars opened up employment opportunities for women. And it's, it, it's hard to remember that women frequently lost their job if they got married. Um, and that was true of teaching and the civil service. But in the Second World War particularly, there were adverse social consequences in the disruption of marriage and family life. It is no surprise that from about 1940, there was a considerable increase in divorce, early bereavement, and second or third marriages. A third aspect of interest is the strong thread of religious belief and commitment running right through the register. I was surprised at the number of graduates who entered convents, not always in seclusion, and often involved in teaching or nursing. But quite apart from that, a perhaps surprising number married clergymen and devoted their lives to church and parish in ways that could not be adequately reflected in the register. More recently, with a certain militancy, no doubt, a number of our senior members have taken late qualifications in theology and have been ordained as deacons and priests, and many more as lay readers. Fourthly, we decided to include father's occupation, and this raises another question about the inclusiveness of college, a theme which has come up two or three times today. I get very tired of the frequent assertions in the media that Oxford is exclusive. On a personal note, I myself as a parson's daughter had free school meals and was fortunate to be a state scholar as my parents could not possibly have afforded to send me to Oxford. You don't have to read far in the register to find daughters of tradesmen alongside daughters of professional men and the occasional aristocrat. There were daughters of policemen and postmen, railway clerks, a spoon and fork stamper from Sheffield, and a sluice gate keeper. And one remembers that the late Lady Healy's father was a crane driver. 
And then there was a rag and mungo merchant. I had to look up the dictionary to discover what a mungo merchant was, and in case you don't know, he was a trader dealing in shoddy and woolen rags. One can't but admire the ambition, hope and trust that propelled those girls to Oxford, and the sacrifice that so many parents must have made to keep them there. It's also striking, especially in the early years, how many undergraduates arrived as orphans of one or both parents. And again, one thinks of their courage in striving to succeed, sometimes without family support. In fact, the daughter of the rag and mungo merchant had lost both her parents when she arrived at St. Hugh's. A further aspect that interested me was the strong involvement of senior members in various types of social work before present-day agencies existed. I'm thinking especially of the settlement house movement, about which I knew only vaguely through St. Hugh's decades-long involvement with St. Margaret's House in Bethnal Green. But there were many other settlements in which our members were involved, in London and other major cities. There was also, especially in the 1920s and 1930s, a strong moral welfare movement, words one would hardly hear in juxtaposition nowadays, involving outreach work with young people in depressed urban areas, often under the aegis of a particular diocese. There was also the work in Britain of the Charities Organisation Society, which you'll find abbreviated to COS in the register, founded in London in 1869, which eventually, in 1946, became the Family Welfare Association, and according to the Wikipedia entry on the internet, still operates today as Family Action, a registered family support charity. Again, all this would make a very interesting research project. Sixthly, there is a particular career development I would like to highlight. In the 1970s, there was a lot of interest in what were called married women returners. And this is a noticeable trend in the register, as well as a tendency for graduates, whether married or not, to make a decisive change of career in midstream. Senior members were taking further qualifications in mid or later life, most notably in our case, going into various forms of psychotherapy, many with great distinction. It was, I think, part of the wider theme of social concern but it would be interesting to know how and why this particular career path was so attractive to so many people. Lastly, I was forcibly struck by the large number of senior members who went abroad to work. It started with our very first student, Miss Jourdain, who spent four and a half years in a settlement in Tokyo from 1920 to 24. Obviously, many had to live abroad and travel widely because of their husband's occupation, whether in the diplomatic service, colonial administration, or in industry, or as missionaries. But there were very many more teaching in schools and universities abroad. Again, it would be good to have a statistical picture of how many there were and where they went. The brain drain, in fact, was nothing new. Finally, again, finally, on a lighter note, I've been very amused by the number of times the career information we had used the word organised. I think St Hugh's raised a particular breed of senior members who were never happier than when setting the world to rights, whether as notable headmistresses or in a great variety of management and administrative positions, organising, controlling and generally bossing people about. I do hope you will enjoy browsing in the register and just find as much to interest you as I have. Thank you. Well, it is a great pleasure for me uh, as a historian here, as one of the History Fellows in St Hugh's, to introduce Laura Schwartz, who is, as you know, the author of A Serious Endeavour, Gender, Education and Community at St Hugh's, 1886 to 2011. And I see it is flying off the tables, as it should be. 
We are, of course, marking um, an important point in the College's history this weekend, and the publication of this book is, I think, a key component of this celebration, not only because it reminds us of the radical and progressive impulses which led to the foundation of this institution for intelligent, but not necessarily well-off women, but also because it encourages us to think about where St Hughes is now in 2011, at a time when, um, shall I politely say, things are difficult in higher education. When we decided several years ago, a collection of us in St Hughes, that the publication of a new history of St Hughes, which would build on the very good work that had been done by earlier historians of the college, should be commissioned to mark this anniversary, we decided to twin this post with an early career fellowship in history. We did this partly because obviously we love to have exciting young scholars in the college, but also because we were very clear from the outset that this would be a serious history of the college. It would not, in other words, be a coffee table book. This would be a history of the college which would contextualise some of the impulses which led to the foundation of St Hugh's and also a book which would understand and explain how this college sometimes slowly, sometimes extremely slowly, has helped in the broader democratisation of the University of Oxford. I know I wasn't the only St Hughes historian at the time. I know John Robertson and George Garnett were uh, with me on this. We all thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if Laura Schwartz applied for this post? She would be perfect. Not only had Laura been an outstanding undergraduate here in history, in St Hughes, and I have to say on a personal level she was one of the first undergraduates I came across and it made me extremely happy to have been appointed at St Hughes. She had also gone on to do very important graduate work in London on precisely the kinds of issues and in the kinds of fields that any historian of St Hughes would have to understand, gender history, women's history, the history of radicalism, and the history broadly of political and social change in Britain in the 19th and 20th century. Well, as you know, she was appointed. We were delighted, and she has more than lived up to our every expectation. This is, as you'll see when you read it, and I encourage you to, because it is a wonderful book. It's a scholarly, serious history of this college, which brings to life many aspects of St Hugh's that make it what it is. Experiences of principals, teachers, students, women, latterly men, Scouts, other staff and various friends of St Hugh's and I think anyone who's had anything to do with the college will see some of their own experiences reflected in this book. It is also what we'd always hoped, a standalone important contribution to broader British social history, particularly to the history of women, education and religion. So it is a real genuine honour for me to thank Laura on behalf of the college for doing such a wonderful job for us and also for her role in organising so many of the things that we've all, we've all enjoyed this weekend, particularly the tours, which I'm sure many of you have enjoyed, and the Day in the Life exhibition, which I think is wonderful. I want to thank her personally as well because I think something very important and exciting has been happening in St Hughes in the last few years. I think we have rediscovered an interest in our own history a pride in our history as a radical institution which opened, it, opened its doors to intellectual women that other institutions weren't prepared to take. And it's been a joy to me to discuss those things with Laura while she's been here. And finally, I want to say just a couple of things very briefly. One is um, that this is, of course, a very important day for Laura in her professional career because we are marking this evening the publication of her first book, which is a milestone in the career of any scholar, and it is a wonderful book. Of course she has another on the way because she is such a good scholar. And also, given uh, how difficult things are at the moment, it's a thrill for me as well, uh, a real pleasure to say that she also has managed to get a job when hardly anybody is getting a job. So with those words, I'd like to again thank Laura and introduce her. Um, I'm afraid that I'm going to begin by saying thank you as well. Um, and that's because this book, perhaps more than most books, 
was very much a collective endeavour to which the entire St Hugh's community contributed. It was shaped by conversations over college lunches, by chance encounters with old students, and by the support and hard work of St Hugh's archivists and historians. It was also only made possible by the generosity of former students, scouts and fellows in agreeing to become the subjects of oral history. And this was the first time that I, as a historian, had written about a living subject. My previous research on the 19th century had permitted me the now, I realise, very comfortable task of promulgating on the lives of the long dead. My St Hugh's subjects, however, were far from being safely locked away in the past and were only too capable of answering back and providing alternative versions of events. So this book took me back to the nuts and bolts of what it means to write history. Although this history of St Hugh's was commissioned, it came with no mandate or instructions. I was simply presented with an archive, a mass of information, papers, books, photographs, and given two years to turn it into a coherent narrative about the development of the college. Yet I also had to work with a historical reality, that of the world around me, the ongoing day-to-day life of St Hugh's. The challenge of the book, then, was how to bring these two kinds of material together, how to tell a story in which memory and myth were shown to be as important as historical fact in shaping the identity of St Hugh's. Yet also a story that asked which aspects of history had been remembered and which forgotten. Why some aspects of college life had been recorded in the archive or mythologised in memory. And why other experiences had been excluded from official historical accounts. I was also, to some extent, writing my own history or rather, this project brought me back to the place where I had started out as a historian and back to the same college where I'd studied as an undergraduate. It made me remember what had so excited me about history in the first place. The discovery that things which often seemed so fixed, so impossible to move in the present, had in fact been utterly different at another moment in time. This is what interested me about the history of gender, especially. Discovering how ideas of what it meant to be a man or a woman had changed over time. The realisation that such apparently essential aspects of our identity were in fact unstable and continually redefined was for me, when I came here at the age of 18, both terrifying and incredibly liberating. So researching the history history of St Hugh's returned me to this theme, tracing how college women from the Victorian era into the second half of the 19th century were active in redefining women's role in society and in transforming Oxford University from an all-male and still almost monastic institution into into a, a place of public higher education, which now accepts roughly equal numbers of male and female undergraduates. The struggle for St Hugh's to be, um, to be admitted to the ancient universities uh, and for women to be admitted to Oxford was a cause that St Hugh's shared with the rest of the women's colleges. But St Hugh's also had its own distinct agenda to charge lower fees to allow young women from less wealthy backgrounds to benefit from an Oxford education. This commitment to openness and accessibility remained an important aspect of St Hugh's identity over the course of the preceding century, and it certainly coloured my decision to apply here in the year 2000. One of the most important questions we need to ask ourselves on this 125th anniversary is what will happen to this legacy in the face of vast increases in university fees 
and drastic cuts to higher education funding. Last month, University Congregation, Oxford's renowned Parliament of Dons, passed a historic motion of no confidence in the university's minister, David Willits, voted through by 384 votes to five. Many of the speeches made that day by fellows from, a cro- from many different disciplines and colleges invoked for me the ghosts of Oxford's past. Many speeches warned against our university becoming a place where the fees were so intimidatingly high that it was to become, once again, an enclave for the elite, where the admission of working-class students depended upon the generosity of wealthy benefactors rather than the belief that education was a right. Sitting in the gallery of the Sheldonian Theatre that afternoon, listening to rather too many speeches, I began to think about Ethel Wallace, who arrived at St Hugh's in 1908 with only the clergy orphan fund to support her, and who just managed to eke her way through her degree by sharing the cheapest of rooms with another similarly disposed student. Such young women could, of course, seek a small amount of financial support from the Bertha Johnson Loan Fund, providing they offered references proving both their poverty and their good character, and only if they were prepared uh, for their academic achievements and moral conduct to be subject to ongoing scrutiny. Another congregation speech, this time by a junior research fellow at another former women's college, St Hilda's, pointed to the impact the proposed cuts would have on lecturers and tutors. She suggested that, as permanent positions give way to short-term and often low-paid contracts, aspiring academics will often require some private means of income to keep them going through the years of risk and precarity uh, necessary before they can secure an established post. I thought again of the early years of St Hugh's, where Helena Denica was employed as the college's first own tutor in 1903. She was offered free room and board, but did not receive any actual wages. In the early 20th century, St Hugh's tutors were expected to cobble together an income by undertaking pockets of hourly paid teaching wherever they could find it. When, in 1923, they were finally offered a minimum basic salary, this represented an enormous step forward in their struggle as women to be recognised as professionals on an equal basis with tutors in the men's colleges. Writing this book made it clear to me that the history of women's education was part of a larger history of the gradual, if very uneven, democratisation of the British universities. The women's colleges were established in a more general atmosphere of university reform, which began to transform Oxford from the 1870s onwards. Following the First World War, college principals fought hard for girls to be able to compete for the first state scholarships introduced after 1918. And formal equality of status with the men's colleges was finally achieved here in Oxford in the 1950s and 60s when higher education became public and free to all. So where does this leave us in 2011? The gloomier among us may be inclined to suggest that the past is beginning to repeat itself, that we're returning to the bad old days. Now, I, however, feel slightly wary of such metaphors, and that's because, as a historian, I don't think that history is something that simply happens to people. A Serious Endeavour really ended up being a book about how big historical narratives, the history of women's education, the emancipation of women, are in fact made up of the everyday life of real people and are shaped, resisted and negotiated by them. For us today, 
This important turning point in the history of higher education, in the history of St Hugh's College, presents a whole new array of choices to be made, paths to be taken, and stories to be told. Whether we like it or not, history is ours to be made and remade. And, like the first four students who arrived at St Hugh's in 1886, we have a task ahead of us to ensure that Oxford widens rather than narrows its remit. In this moment, the past returns to us. I bring you stories of former St Hugh's members, not because I think they're a necessarily straightforward lessons to be learned from history. I don't think that it offers us a clear moral message, but I do think that it can keep us company. That history can offer us a reference point warnings and hope and inspiration as we continue to redefine what education means, what we could be doing better, and which of our values are worth fighting for. Thank you.